Hello everybody, this is Mr. Matthew, and this is video number three in our Biological Evolution series. In this video, we're going to talk about how evolution can be demonstrated by viruses and bacteria. Now, this may seem a little bit different because usually we talk about bacteria when we talk about, you know, different types of cells, or sometimes we talk about it in the history of life on Earth. Sometimes we talk about it when we're doing classification. And viruses, we can talk about viruses in all sorts of different places. But because both viruses and bacteria reproduce very quickly and have very short generation times, and also they both have a fairly rapid change in genetic material through mutations and again because of their rapid generation time, they're actually really good for looking at evolution. Both the evolution of the bacteria and viruses themselves, as well as looking at viruses and bacteria as forces that can shape the evolution of other species. Here are a couple of scanning electron microscope images of viruses. Um, over on the left hand side we have an Epstein-Barr virus. Over on the right hand side we have a bacteriophage. And one of the key things we can look at is when we look at viruses, regardless of what type, we will see a couple commonalities. We will see that they're going to have a protein coating on the outside and they will have DNA or RNA, some sort of nucleic acid genome, on the inside. Aside from that, they're going to have enormous variety of shapes. Many viruses are going to be shown uh, to be like that one on the left, that Epstein bar virus. HIV looks similar. Influenza looks similar. A lot of the pox viruses look similar. But that's one form. Over on the right hand side, we see a bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are often used because they infect bacteria. There's lots of different types. They also have been used in a lot of classic experiments uh, in the history of biology. An important thing to keep in mind is that viruses are enormously diverse, and every living thing or every type of living thing that exists on Earth can be infected by some type of virus. Uh, viruses are extremely successful. They are not considered living, uh, although every once in a while you'll hear them grouped in with microbes. Technically speaking, viruses are biological entities, but non-living biological entities, meaning they are factors that once they get inside living cells, they can reproduce, but they have no replication or energy mechanism on their own, so we typically classify them as non-living infectious particles. Now, bacteria are living things, and again, like viruses, they're enormously diverse. So I'm showing you an image of one type of bacteria here, uh, but keep in mind that bacteria are extremely variable. Uh, there are two giant domains of um, organisms that lack a nucleus, and that's usually our general characteristic that we use with bacteria. Within that classification, though, there is enormous variability of the genomes, enormous variability of the uh, membrane and wall structures that surround the outside. But typically when we talk about bacteria, we're talking about non-nucleated cells. They will have ribosomes, they'll have cytoplasm, they'll have a cell membrane and a cell wall, but they'll lack any of the membrane-bound organelles that we see in eukaryotic cells. And again, we can go enormously diverse with that, and we'll probably talk about that when we talk about cells and other uh, units during the year, but for now, that's just going to be our basic definition of bacteria. So why are we grouping those together? Well, there are a couple of key features. Uh, what we'll see is that both of these types of biological entities have a high rate of mutation. So when we talk about um, viruses, uh, particularly RNA viruses, RNA is a less stable molecule than DNA in terms of its conservation. When it gets copied, uh, there are more mistakes made. So RNA-based viruses are going to have really high rates of mutation. And DNA viruses also will have mutations as well, but uh, will be a little bit more stable than an RNA virus. When we talk about bacteria, bacteria typically reproduce asexually, and so mutations are the primary method by which their genomes are going to change. However, they also will have the ability to take in DNA from outside. We sometimes call that transformation, and they can pick up genes that way uh, along with mutation. So there's a, a good a variety of ways for these to diversify their genomes in spite of the fact that they don't go through sexual reproduction. 
And then speed of reproduction, uh, when we talk about the age of a living thing like a bacteria or a biological entity like a virus, these things will reproduce super fast. And so we're going to get many, many generations within a short period of time. It's not unusual to have large number of generations within a single day. And each of those offspring that have their own offspring will increase the variation and diversity within the living things over time. And so we will see the ability for these populations to go under a great deal of change compared to a human scale. So let's take a look at some examples of evolution in each of these two groupings. When we look at a virus, Viral evolution is usually seen in a method like this. Let's say an individual host uh, gets exposed to a bird flu. That's what we mean by an avian strain. And then let's also say they get exposed to a humid strain. Now what will happen is those two viral particles will get into cells and possibly get into the same human cells and they'll actually mix. This is called zoonosis and in this instance these two different viral strains will fuse together and create a hybrid that is different. It'll have some of the genes of each of the two strains and it will have some of the proteins of each of these two strains. In this particular example that's shown here, we're producing a new highly pathogenic human strain. This would be the way that, say, a bird flu could become a, a pandemic bird flu that could travel around the world. Now, just like we've talked about before, the ability to survive and reproduce is the only real standard by which we use evolution. So it's entirely possible that a human being will get exposed to two different particles, or in this case actually could be a bird as well, could be in, infected with these two particles, and the combination is not more pathogenic. It, it will produce a new strain, a new evolutionary strain, but it may or may not be more harmful. Uh, there's no set directionality. Viruses don't evolve towards being more harmful necessarily or more virulent. This is just a this is just one possibility. But the idea here is that when a new type of host gets exposed to viral particles, there can be a change. There's lots and lots of examples of this where humans are exposed to a virus particle that's normally not an infectious particle within humans, but the right type of strain gets into a human being, it reproduces, and we generate a new type of virus. Similarly, these can infect other types of animals, and we can have a similar outcome. So this type of idea of an emerging infectious virus or how a virus could evolve within a new host is sometimes how we see new types of viruses that are infecting people or infecting animals. When we talk about bacterial evolution, what we're seeing here is we have bacteria that are exposed typically to some sort of medication. Now, the important thing here to note is that within the bacterial population, there is existing variation. And then we expose that uh, population to a drug. And the non-resistant bacteria you know, that normally would multiply, when they get exposed to the drug, they're going to die. But the drug-resistant members of those population, they're going to not be able to be killed, and they're going to survive and spread after the exposure to the drugs. And so what we'll see here is that we have a natural variation that occurs, and the medicine in this case, the drugs that are applying, are actually providing a selective pressure. And so the final population that we see are going to be these highly resistant particles. So when we hear about things like antibiotic resistance in population, or we're concerned about antibiotic resistant bacteria or antibiotic resistant infections like MRSA, for example, the reason that we're concerned about this is that there was an initial population, but through the overuse of antibiotics, we've selected against all of the type of staph infection that are in that given area except for the ones that can resist the use of the specific antibiotics. And so this is where we see uh, an increase in resistance of certain types. So when we talk about the effective use of antibiotics, this is something to keep in mind. All right, so in summary, what are we talking about? After this video, you should be able to research and communicate information about key features of viruses and bacteria to explain their 
ability to adapt and reproduce in a wide variety of environments. Specifically, we're looking at examples that would have a relation to something like antibiotic resistance. When we talk about our clarification statement, we're looking at the, the key features of both bacteria and viruses are their high rates of mutation and their speed of reproduction, uh, which produce many generations with high variability in a short period of time, getting that massive diversification, and that allows them to go into new environments and also with selective pressure, there'll be a lot of different types of variability for the possibility of survival if the environment changes. And one little thing, particularly for those of you in Massachusetts, uh, we may go into viruses a little bit more detail in class, but just so you guys know, uh, specific types of viral re reproduction, uh, lytic and lysogenic, are not supposed to be on the Massachusetts State Assessment. So uh, it's just sort of a clarification they put into our frameworks. Just wanted to make sure you know about that. If you're, again, if you're not in Massachusetts and you're not worried about the MCAS, uh, that really doesn't apply to you. All right, so that's the conclusion of video number three. I hope that was helpful and I will post video four soon.